Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling Applied Multivariate Analysis. And we're in Chapter 11 part of this playlist that I'm calling Factor Analysis. And let's jump to today's topic, which is Orthogonal Factor Model. Now let's assume we take a random sample from 1 to n from a homogeneous population with mean vector mu and covariance matrix sigma. So note that this random sample these are vectors, so there's p variables that we're collecting on each observation. And in the factor analysis model, we want to represent those p variables, so like the, these y1, 2, 3, you know, through p are, are collected on each observation. And we want, to, we want to model these p variables as a linear combination of a few random variables which we denote by F1, F2 to Fm, they're called factors, and M is strictly less than P. So P is the number of variables in our vector, and M is the model. Now in the first video, we showed how five variables can really be thought of two factors. So math and, and programming were part of the factor logical thought and history, English literature and some other <laughs> variable were related with literacy uh, and and so those five variables can really be thought of as a function or a combination of these two factors and so that's what we want to do so we have p variables we want to model them in terms of these m factors so it looks like linear regression I and mean, that's what it reminds me of in this or you know multiple regression we have the error terms associated with each variable. And the Fs, which are, are unobservable, and they're latent variables. So it's we, we know that certain variables are highly correlated, and there's probably some latent variable that is associated with those variables. And we and it turns out that that we want you know M factors. We're going to create an M factor model. Now the lambdas are called loadings, and they're, they're, they tell us the importance of that factor to the variable. So just picking one, it, it, for instance, Y1 is modeled like this, and if the lambda is large in front of the factor, it says that factor is important to modeling that variable Y. The epsilons are the error terms that account for the part of the variable that is not unique or not in common with the other variables. So we want to be able to model this each variable in terms of these factors, but there's going to be an error associated with it. And that's what these epsilons are called. Now, all the R software program, which we'll look at in a minute, calls these the uniqueness. This is unique to that variable. So these these factors account for most of the information in Y with some error. And so this the errors are unique to that variable. That's why they call them uniqueness. Some call them specific variance. So the basic assumptions of this model is that the average factor value is zero, the variance is one, the covariance between any two factors are zero, the average epsilon, the average uniqueness, the average specific value or specific variance is zero. The variance is of, a of a uniqueness is what we call psi. The covariance between any two error terms or uniquenesses are zero. The covariance between a uniqueness and a factor is zero. So this yields the variance associated with the observation i is going to be the sum of the squared loadings plus the uniqueness. And I'm going to scroll back up in a second. So if we take the variance of this, so the variance of this, now the constant doesn't pl play a part, so it's the variance of y1, and each of these are random variables, and so if you take the variance, that constant comes out squared, the variance of that factor is 1, this comes out squared, the variance of that's 2, the covariance between all of these are 0, so that's why it's the sum of the variances. And then the variance with, of the epsilon 1 is, is psi 1. And if we scroll back down, that's what this is telling us. So now the part of the variance associated with the f 
factors is the sum of the squared loadings. And the variance that is associated with the uniqueness or the specific variance or the error term is psi. And then we'll look at this relationship in uh, uh, later videos. Now the model in matrix form is this y minus mu lambda f plus epsilon. And so it's, it's written in this form. Now the assumptions that we just described in the univariate fashion or the scalar notation, I should say, is this. So the expected value of the factors, remember there's m factors. It's a uh, zero vector. The covariance associated with the m factors is an identity matrix. The expected value of epsilon is zero. The covariance of epsilon is the diagonal matrix psi, right? Because all the covariances between the epsilons are zero. But down the diagonal is the variance associated with that, and that's what we are calling uh, psi. Now, R, the R software program calls these the uniqueness, the uniqueness values, and the covariance between the factor and the epsilon are zero. Now, in factor analysis, we want to model the covariance of our random variable y. That's the goal. And so the covariance of y, we generically, by assumption, you know, we said it has a mean of mu and a covariance of sigma. And this is what we want to model. Now, notice if we take the covariance of this, you know, the constant doesn't play a part. And the covariance, the loadings will come out front, transposed out back. Covariance of, of this is the identity matrix. This is the diagonal matrix psi. So when we look at the covariance of y, which we denoted by sigma, it's this covariance. But the covariance between f and epsilon are zero, so it's just the sum of the covariances. This, the loadings are constant, so it comes out front and transposed out back. This is the diagonal matrix psi. Covariance of f is the identity. And this is it. So we want to find a matrix of loadings and the diagonal matrix of uh, psi, the uniquenesses, that represent our covariance matrix. That's our goal. Now, in a generic way to write this, let's say we have a two-factor model with five variables. So P is 5, M is 2. We would write it in this fashion, right? The five variables are being modeled as a linear combination of two factors. And of course, there's always error associated with that. But if we look at the variance associated with our variables, remember it's it's this right here. So it's the loadings times the transpose of the loadings plus the diagonal matrix psi. And so when you take this uh, matrix product here, you get the these lambdas. And then when you add this diagonal matrix, it's added to each diagonal term. Okay. So this is the covariance matrix. This is how we're going to model it. Now, here's a note that if the first variable and the second variable are highly correlated, means they're, they're related to each other, this term is going to be large. If they're not related, then that term is small. And that's what I say here. So they have what uh, if they have a great deal in common, this, this term is going to be large. Otherwise, it's small. Now, the variance associated with each variable are the diagonal elements, right? So it's the squared, the sum of the squared loadings for that row plus this uniqueness term. Now, these are called the commonalities. Now, it's called a commonality. Um, and so this is the specific variance called the uniqueness. And so the commonality, also referred to as common variance, it's interpreted as this, the proportion of the variance of y accounted for the common or counted for or by the common factors. Now, the specific variance is the unique component to that variable that can't be explained by those m factors. So it can be shown that the covariance of y in any factor is that loading value. 
and hence the loadings represent the covariance of the variables with the factors. So the covariance of our random variable y and the m factors is this loadings matrix. Now recall that the structure of our matrix is in this form. Now it's quite rare that the covariance matrix can be expressed in this form, you know, with with m relatively small. So, you know, uh, lambda, the loadings, is a p by m matrix, and with it small, it's, it's, it's sort of rare that we can represent it exactly. But this structure is essential for when we're estimating these or, and doing, uh, yeah, for estimating these. Now, here's a big note. If the variables in Y are not commensurate, so the variables in Y have different units or the variances are not similar across the different variables, then many say that we should replace the covariance matrix with the correlation matrix. And, so, and some feel that you should always use a correlation matrix. Now, the function in R always uses the correlation matrix. And I think it's a safe bet to use the correlation matrix in place of the covariance matrix. So we'll model the covariance matrix in this fashion. So the goal is to find the loadings and the specific variances or the uniqueness that make this as close as possible, right? So it, it will almost never be the same. So we want it as close as possible. Now, as a quick example, we're just going to essentially list the R command and then call our quits for today, and then we'll do more in later videos. So if we have 30 brands of, of Japanese wine, and this was studied in 1963, to find the relationship between taste, odor, pH, different acidities, the sake meter, uh, types of sugar, alcohol, formal nitrogen. And let's use this data to create a uh, four factor factor analysis. So the function in R is called fact anal, it stands for factor analysis. You literally put in the data frame how many factors you want, and then it pops out results. So this is the uniqueness, these are the air terms. Now this creates a diagonal matrix here, but instead of putting the whole matrix, we just put the diagonal elements. And these are the loadings. This is the lambda matrix that we get in modeling these four factors. Now, the sum of squares loadings, that's the variance associated with factor one and the variance associated with factor two and three and four. Now, the proportion of variance accounted for by each of these, that's what this represents. So factor one accounts for most of the variance, which is a good thing. The cumulative variance, these four factors account for about 76% of the variance. And there's also a hypothesis test associated with this. Now, the p-value is small, which says that the four-factor model seems appropriate for this data set. Now, if the p-value is not zero, that I mean, if it's small, it would say there's evidence that this four-factor model is not appropriate. Okay, so I went over a little, a little over, I'm at 13 minutes, so I hope you enjoyed this, I sure did, please like the video, and subscribe so you don't miss the next one, thanks, bye.